Welcome, everybody. Welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. And today we have Glenn Jocker, who is the CEO of Ultralytics. And most of you must have heard about Ultralytics through their product, YOLO V5. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Glenn, and I'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself in bigger detail, you know, in, in uh, detail. But let me first introduce uh, uh, Phil Nelson, who is the content manager at OpenCV. And uh, Phil, do you want to say a few words? Actually, let me take it back. Phil is the director of content. I keep the, you know, he's, he's done such a fabulous job that uh, we decided that the right, um, right uh, uh, title for him is the director of content, uh, Phil. Thank you, Satya. Yeah, I'm still getting looping in my headset here, so I feel like a crazy person. But welcome, everyone, to OpenCV Weekly Webinar, episode 65, if you can believe that. It is I, once again, the co-host with the co-most, the second banana who is second to none, the master of the metaverse, Phil Nelson. And I'm here to remind you of a few things we do every single week here on OpenCV Weekly Webinar, which is a special giveaway to you in the audience. Please stand by for that later in the episode. For if you've never tuned in before, I'll be asking a question from our uh, slides based on the presentation here by Glenn. We also are taking Q&A from you in the audience, so ask those questions using the Zoom chat link or uh, the Zoom Q&A link or anywhere else you're watching. Post a comment and we'll try to get to all your questions. Welcome, uh, welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. Um, and I Thanks mean, for having us, me. Most of us have used YOLO V5 and because we are having this looping issue, I would actually let you take the stage and run with the presentation, and then we'll yeah. go over audience questions. People will have a lot of questions for you. I probably should give a bit of a background uh, into myself and how we got here today. So let's see. So you guys can see this blue slide, right? Ultralytics, making AI easy. That's sharing, okay? Yep, I can see it. All right, perfect. Okay. so. Uh, uh, Ultralytics actually started a while ago. So I was living in the DC area. This is a bit of a storytelling here, kind of like an intro. Uh, so I was living in the DC area in 2014 and I was working for a defense contractor and I decided I want to kind of branch out on my own. And so I started Ultralytics and I started working initially on some really interesting particle physics applications. So this is way before I got into AI. Uh, my, my main interest there was physics, and I had sort of a passion for discovering our place in the universe, how things work, and uh, trying to really learn the origins of kind of like what makes us us and, and what makes us unique in the world. And so uh, I started working on two different programs, and they were particle physics applications for some spy agencies. Uh, these two agencies were the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency. And they were interested in, in anti-neutrino detectors. And so neutrinos are really fascinating particles. Uh, they do something called oscillating among three different flavors, which makes them very unique and also very confusing. And we were trying to learn a little more by studying them more closely. So we build these small detectors, collect neutrinos, and end up with a lot of data. And it was my job to analyze the data and so I did this for several years, and this is when I started doing data analysis techniques. And everything I did was not enough. All the classical techniques, statistical analysis, uh, Bayesian optimization, these sorts of things, just they weren't getting us where we needed to go. And I was looking for something that could help us improve on the data analysis side. And what we really needed to do was determine what we were seeing. So this is a classification problem. Was it a neutrino? Was it maybe like an electron, positron? And then if we did detect a neutrino, we wanted to know a few things about it, like the energy. Yeah, so, okay, so ultimately all my particle physics efforts crashed and burned. Uh, <laughs> the detectors didn't work and the data analysis didn't go anywhere. But this meant I had a lot of free time and I developed an interest in AI. And this is about three years ago now. And uh, by coincidence, this is when uh, some of the coolest AI architectures were making their way out in publications like Yolo V3 by Joseph Redman. And I took an interest in this paper and I thought, uh, I, I saw a lot of potential in the technology and I learned about what I liked and didn't like about working for the government. And part of what I didn't like was keeping everything secret. And so I started to open source my new work. And also I wanted to create a real world product, right? Something that wasn't just 
working in a laboratory, something that we could take out into the world that would have an impact on everyday lives. And so I looked at YOLO, I looked at what Redmond was doing and it was really impressive. And I thought I should try and understand what he did. Uh, unfortunately, he'd written everything in C++, which I wasn't an expert in. Um, and I wanted to translate that into Python, which I was just getting started in, and which was much more similar to the MATLAB that I'd used before. And so I started working in Python at the same time as I started doing AI, at the same time as I started open sourcing my work. And this is really just three years ago. Uh, so we've come a long way, but uh, when I started, I had no idea what I was doing. So my chief task in life at that point was simply to reproduce the YOLO v3 results in a much more appealing format, which is Python and PyTorch. Uh, I started working on those. I entered a competition and I did miserably, but I learned a lot and I kept working, I kept working. And during the course of this, uh, something interesting happened. So, so Joseph's work had gotten really popular. Uh, he worked on it together with his advisor, Ali Farhadi. And during one conference that Joseph was presenting at, he even did TED Talks. And I think at the end of one of these TED Talks, uh, an army general came up to him and he said he was very impressed by the technology and he could see it really being used in drones on the battlefield. And this raised a lot of red flags in Joseph's head. He said, oh, this isn't what I had pictured for this technology and you know, I don't want it to fall into the wrong hands. And he thought the best way to address those concerns would simply be to stop working on it, to kind of like recuse himself from the field. And so sort of famously did just that. so in the in the yeah. industry, it was big news. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is this is really like kind of like a monumental event. And uh, at that point, uh, Ollie had started a company also uh, using AI. It was called Xnor.ai. And he eventually sold that to Apple, I think for two hundred million dollars, and he's still at Apple. So when I arrived on the scene, uh, this happened shortly after, and the YOLO ship was sort of without a captain for the first time. So versions one, two, and three had been released. And it seemed like there were no more coming. Uh, so it took me about a year uh, to get up and running and to sort of reproduce the results that Joseph had. And this was a year of a lot of work. This is, you know, seven days a week, 12 hour days, running experiments uh, and just learning a lot, reading papers. And slowly but surely, you know, my results crept up and, and finally I could reproduce what he did. And then at that point, I wasn't sure what to do. And so I just kept doing what I'd already done, which was R&D, trying to improve the model, trying to improve the uh, augmentation techniques, the loss functions and things like that. And I kept working on it for a few more months. And at that point, I'd, uh, I'd have something that I'd call YOLO v3. So I had a repository called Ultralytics slash YOLO v3. And I'd show people the improvements that I'd made. And something funny would happen. They'd say, oh, Glenn, that's, that's really impressive. But I think you did this wrong because that's not in the original paper. And I'd say, oh, no, it is not in the original paper. That's the whole point. I'm trying to make it better. Uh, but I realized I had like a bit of a naming issue and I thought, okay, maybe I should call this something different so that people don't get too confused so much. And so I worked on it some more and I had this idea to release what I'd done and call it YOLO v4. And so I'd started collaborating with two key players in the space. Uh, one is Alexei AB, who was in Moscow at the time. I think he's since moved to Berlin. And the other was a developer in Taiwan who goes by the GitHub handle, I think Yang Can You. And we were kind of bouncing ideas back and forth and uh, working on improving YOLO together. And so about uh, two years ago, like in early 2020, uh, Lexi and I were shooting back ideas back and forth. And this is when I was working on my improvements and I had stopped open sourcing those improvements and I created a new repo, which I called V4 and I was about to release it when someday, one day I woke up and somebody sent me a message and they say, Glenn, have you seen the news? And I said, no, what? And they said, they said, Alexi has released the YOLO V4 uh, repository in the paper. And so I was really shocked. So it turns out we'd both been doing the same thing. Like Alexi had been working on some improvements in secret and me too. He beat me to the punch and he released his architecture. And so I was really again, surprised. Coming back, coming around <laughs> to play a big point in your life, a big part in your life. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, so again, there's this drama and controversy. People criticized the Yolo V4 paper a lot because Alexi was not directly connected to Joseph. Um, mm. But I, I read the paper and, uh, and I incorporated like what I saw is Alexi's key contributions into what I was doing. I worked a little bit more. And then a few months later, I thought, okay, I need to release this again. But now what do I call this? Because Alexi got there first with the YOLO v4 name. And I decided just to increment it one more, call it YOLO. And then even more controversy uh, came up on the scene and people were again critical. And they said, they said, these two guys are completely unconnected. And the speed with which he'd released it one after the other also brought a lot of controversy. People were joking around and saying, by the end, you know, this rate, by the end of the year, we're gonna have like YOLO 17. 
Uh, and so at first I engaged with the criticism. I tried to explain to people that I was simply seeking to improve, but, but it's kind of difficult uh, dealing with detractors. And so at some point I decided, okay, I'm just gonna work on this and just let people say what they want to say. And so I just kept my head down. I kept working on Yolo V5, kept improving it. And the important point is that it wasn't a static launch. So uh, Yolo V5 has been out for like two years right now. And like every day it's different than the previous day. Uh, it keeps improving in small but steady ways. And I think the important thing is the cumulative effort of all these weeks. And so periodically we have new releases now. Uh, we're on 6.1 and the, the 6.1 release of Yolo V5 is a completely different animal than the original one that launched two years ago. So, and, and now there's, there's even more YOLOs out there. There's YOLO X, there's YOLO R, there's YOLO V6, there's a couple of YOLO V7s. So, so you, it's, you might it's a real interesting what time. You, what you've actually got here is YOLO V5 V6. <laughs> I, I don't know. We, we have a bit of a naming issue. Uh, but at the same time, I, I love the space. It's exciting. There's changes every day. I never know what's going to happen when I wake up. It's an incredible time to, to be well, in Well, I mean, AI. who, who does? Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think that's just the world we're living in, Glenn. <laughs> and so this brings me to this talk that I have here. Uh, so we've recently started going to some conferences. And uh, one, of the, one of the more fun ones we went to was in France. It was the Con AI Conference, which was a month before mm -hmm. the Con AI Film Festival. It's really swanky. The food is really good. And I put together yeah. a few slides about how I thought that YOLO could do good for the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so day to day, obviously, you know, our lives are full of technicalities as ML developers and deep learning scientists. We do a lot of experimentation. We're worried about layers and architectures, uh, but it's very important to keep in mind the bigger picture, right? And the bigger picture is why are we developing these architectures? Like what compels us uh, to wake up and simply contribute in the open source space? And for me, my main motivation is the positive impact that the technology could have in the world. Um, so I, I realized Joseph had the alternate conclusion, uh, but in my mind, I think technology is not a good nor bad. It could be used uh, for both ways. And I think uh, another key element is that we put it in the hands of everybody. So if the technology has the potential to improve lives, and if it's broadly accessible and uh, the barrier to entry is low, then I think those are the key elements uh, that can help us improve the world we live in, the lives of the people around us. And so these slides talk about that. That's a, that's a great way to think about it. And this, I think this mirrors really closely a lot of what OpenCV has been doing with, say, OpenCV AI Kit, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, OpenCV has been a key part of the Yolo V5 repository. We use it by default in our data loaders. And a lot of what I've done to date wouldn't have been possible without it. Uh, so I have to Great. give a big thanks to the entire OpenCV team also. Yeah, big thanks to the engineering side, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, so, whew. all right, so the world we live in, uh, every year it seems like we're dealing with uh, more problems. And uh, the, the first and foremost here is, is global warming, which affects all of it. So I'm here in Madrid in Spain, and we have about 41, 42 degrees Celsius days for the foreseeable future here. And I'm not even sure if it's a heat wave or just the new normal. So 2020 was the warmest year ever on record. Uh, and due to global warming, uh, up to 200 species are going extinct every day across the planet. And of course, these are man-made changes that are caused by uh, airborne pollutants, CO2. So every year, 25% uh, of deaths are directly attributable to air pollution and 10 million tons of plastic into the world's oceans. Uh, so this is plastic that doesn't biodegrade, that lives in our ecosystems for a long, long time. It's not uh, even another problem. what we're learning a lot about re these days too, microplastics, which are showing right, up right. in, in human yeah. bloodstreams. In and human beings, yeah. Concentrations, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of uh, artificial contributors to the environment that, that didn't exist in the past and we just don't know what they're consequences are for us, the long-term mm -hmm. consequences. So uh, I'm Spanish and American. My mom is from Spain, my dad's from New York. Uh, in Spain, there's universal healthcare, uh, but in the US there isn't. In the US healthcare is something that you have to pay a lot of money for sometimes. Uh, so here we see that 50% of the world's population lacks access to essential healthcare services. And even in countries where they have access, sometimes the price points put it out of reach, like in the US. And every year, 100 million people are pushed into 
extra poverty due to health expenses. So in the US, it's very common to have uh, very high medical debt. You, you get an operation and you could be in debt for 50 or $100,000. So uh, hunger is another key problem. So almost 10% of the world's population is in hunger day to day and a staggering 2 billion people lack year round access to adequate food. So for a lot of us, we take this for granted, but that's not true for other people around the world. And lastly, inequality. Uh, a lot of us are born lucky. We, we live in first world countries um, and this allows us to do things like develop ML models, but for other people, they're simply trying to survive. And uh, 700 million people are living on less than $2 a day and 40% of people have no formal education. So they don't even really get the chance to, to learn coding, to learn technologies that, that we all love and use every day. So some of these are new and some of these are problems that we face throughout history. But one of the differences now we have access to technology that didn't exist before. And the key question is how can we use this technology? How can we use it to tackle some of these problems that we've seen? Uh, so how can we do it while wearing sunglasses? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and this is where YOLO V5 comes in. So uh, I think that we have the opportunity here in the AI space to really unleash a lot of positive potential. So as you guys know, AI algorithms were first uh, theorized in the 60s and the 70s, and it's really taken half a century for the hardware to catch up and to enable uh, a lot of the capabilities that scientists really dreamed about 50 years ago. And so um, the company that I put together, so Ultralytics is a really small startup. We're about a dozen people. Uh, we're unfunded. Um, so we work on just organic growth. And we really believe in a smarter world. We believe in technology that's sensitive, first and foremost, to the people uh, and the problems that surround us. And also importantly, we, we want this to be in everybody's hands. Like if we develop something that's expensive, it's not suitable. If we develop something that's uh, only accessible by a small portion of the population, I don't like that. And so part of my key goal with the OLV5 has been to make it uh, easy to train and easy to deploy. And by easy, I mean things like not consuming a lot of resources. Uh, so, so people with small GPUs or even no GPUs could train really tiny models and, and start to get in there. So, so we call Yellow V5 the world's most popular AI in 2022. Uh, there's a lot of architectures out there. Glenn, yeah. it would help uh, if you tell about, you know, where your, uh, all the developers are located. Uh, can, can, yeah, can we yeah. go back to that previous Pardon? slide? Too, this whole, yeah, this is, I thought yeah, this is I thought for a minute team here. I thought for a minute this was a stock photo, but no, no, no. This is yeah. This is a, this is part of the team here at Ultralytics. Um, so Ultralytics, even though we're a dozen people, the ML developers until a month ago was just me. Uh, we we recently picked on a second developer to help us expand tasks, and so we're we're actually one of the exciting things that's happening is we're going into classification segmentation, and those updates should be released in the next few months. But the, the people we see here, we have uh, mobile developers, web developers, and marketing people. And the mobile and web developers are for like an exciting new product that we're launching that's making it easier for people to train and deploy YOLO models. And we're starting it with a free tier also, just like YOLO. So, uh, so it's really important awesome. to me to put tools out there in the space and make it for free as much as possible. But yeah, so this is, uh, this is like part of the core team here at Ultra. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of here hidden behind this guy, John. <laughs> And then we have Kaylin next to me, who's our lead web developer. We've got Talia, who's our marketing lead. Uh, she's been creating amazing content to help people show what we do. And then we've got Sergio next to Talia, and Sergio's our main mobile developer. And he's helping make our app. And this is one of the things that, that I love about us to differentiate this. When I showed up two or three years ago, all the models were out there, but I had no idea what they looked like or what they did. And I really wanted to just put it in my hand and use it and point it around. And, and now we see what it did. And so I made our first app. And I have no idea how I did that because I don't know Swift. I, I don't know anything about app development. Somehow I, I got it done. It was a terrible journey. And after that, I decided no more. I need to bring on an actual mobile developer. And that's when we, that's when we got Sergio. And he was the second employee number two here. <laughs> that's, I so, think that's how a lot of, like, most of the good companies grow that way. The, <laughs> the founders <laughs> be like, I hate doing this. Can we pay someone? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was thinking uh, I need standard. to stick to what I'm good at. Yeah. <laughs> Making yeah. apps is not that. <laughs> so, all right, so, oh, and by the way, speaking of apps, like if you guys haven't seen YOLO apps yet, so we have an official app, it's called Ultralytics. Uh, my original app is called Eye Detection. But if you go to any of the Apple, Apple App Store, Google Play Store, you just search for YOLO V5, search for Ultralytics. I'm sure these will rise at the top. And then you can actually see the different models. We show the different models. You can switch between them, point it around the room and, 
have fun. Kind of like learn and see what this will do. That kind of real time feedback is really important. That our our guests uh, last week were Mm -hmm. Anna and Vadim from uh, Model Place, and I think that shares a similar goal here uh, to your to your app. Like you were saying, you want to be able to see what they actually looked like on on your real data, and uh, yeah, you know that that. Oh man, my camera just dropped out. Uh, that uh, you know happens um, when people can see their own data on there. It's much easier for them to understand how it really works. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think a lot of these things that I did is, I think they're due to the fact that I came in from the outside. Uh, so I, I wasn't. I, I never learned ML in school. I never learned AI. I didn't take any classes. And uh, when I came in, I had a lot of questions, and I I wanted some kind of like real world answers. And I think I think part of uh, what we have here is. Is that, and I think that's that's partly what resonates with the community. I think people come in to AI because they see the hype and they want to they want a piece of it. They want to learn. They get excited. And for me, uh, like seeing something like in my hand was just I don't know. It sounds a little cavemanish, but it's it's what made me happy. And so that's why that's why I made the app. And I think that's why I put it front and center on the repository to show people that they can actually use it. Versus like if you go to another architecture, sometimes there's papers which are impressive. There's research and equations, um, but translating that into the real world for me is is not always clear. So, yeah, uh, so let's we see here. So, have uh, an app uh, that people can uh, use, and if the source code is also available, then people can. It's a starting point. It actually eliminates mm-hmm. most of the big uh, problems people have. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's starting, which is the bigger problem, right? Once you once you get th- something going, uh, everything else becomes very easy. So, if you get starter code, and Glenn, I'm sure that when you started. You obviously used a lot of code from that other people had shared, so it's it's great that you're sharing all this open source code. Oh no, absolutely, guys. Um, uh, the, for example, when uh, when Newton was uh, was getting credit for having discovered gravity, he said, "If I can see further than others, it's because I've stood in the shoulders of giants." And that's true for all of us. Like none of us start from zero. None of us can really take like full credit for what we deliver. Uh, we we never want to reinvent the wheel to save time. And in doing so, you should always try and find the best starting point, the best approximation to what you like. Uh, start from there and, and, and take it to where you think it should go. And, and I've done the same thing. You know, I, I can't take credit for, for YOLO or a lot of things. Um, all I've really done here is take what Joseph and all he invented uh, and try and make it like a little better and a little more usable. So, so we always deserve credit. Uh, we should assign credit to everybody that came before us here. Uh, let's see here. So, okay. So now that we've got YOLO here, like what are some things that we could do with it? What can we do besides simply taking the app and showing it around the room and showing your friends, which is fun, but how do we actually, how do we actually make an impact on the world? How do we make the world a better place? So, um, and a lot of what I'm showing here, none of this is, is direct work of mine or ultralytics. This is, these are use cases that we've spotted around the community that I think are really exciting that we'd like to let people know about. And so one of these is cancer detection. So we've seen publications by different research groups, peer reviewed publications in journals like IEEE, uh, showing like a just tremendous potential for uh, medical possibilities. And so one of these is cancer detection. Uh, so in the US, for example, we've got doctors that are really expensive. You get an x-ray and you need a guy to review it and it's gonna charge you a lot of money. And uh, if we can automate that process, then we can expand healthcare to segments that uh, don't have the money to pay for it. Not only that, but there's more benefits. You can get faster responses. Um, and I think, I think it's just, uh, this is really incredible. And this is also just like initial research that we've seen. So here we see 97% cancer detection rates. And cancer is just one thing, obviously. Uh, like x-rays can pick up a lot of other things, but there's also very many visual fields. Like when you go to the eye doctor uh, in the US every year, if you have an eye prescription, you need to get renewed. And if we could automate that process, uh, perhaps we could make it more economical, more affordable, and so on. So we talked about plastic in the oceans, which is a tremendous problem. There is a student group uh, outside of Washington, D.C., who trained YOLO V5 on plastic bags in the ocean. They trained a really small model, and it's, it's working about 90% uh, precision. And the idea is that they're going to put this on a submersible with the robotic arm, which is the next step to actually fish out these bags from the ocean and actually start reversing uh, the pollution, the contamination. I think this is incredible. So these are these are steps that could be taken to actually not just help the world, but kind of start reversing the damage that we've done to it. 
Yeah. Okay. So wildfires are, are a very serious problem. Um, part of the problem with the wildfires is that they get started and nobody sees them in the initial stages. And so we have different research groups that are working on targeting different areas of the problem here. Uh, so one of these is wildfire detection for, uh, for smoke and also for the flames themselves. And this could be for stationary cameras uh, or drone cameras. And the idea would be to detect these earlier and get first responders to tackle them faster. And this is, this is a very serious issue. Um, we've got two offices in Los Angeles and in Madrid. Uh, in Portugal right now, right next to us, there's, there's a huge wildfire going on. And uh, last year when I was in Los Angeles, the entire city was unbreathable. It was COVID, so we were, we were wearing masks. Um, and if it wasn't COVID, I think we'd have still been wearing masks because uh, like the visibility was like 100 meters. And uh, all of this is just from smoke in the air from wildfires in the state. Yeah, Californians uh, so, in the audience will uh, recognize that for our, our yearly mm -hmm. ritual. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, okay, so the research is good, but the, in my time doing government research, I realized that unless, unless something that you make has commercial potential, then it's gonna, it's gonna be hard to get traction for it. And we see this, for example, in the space industry. So NASA and the government fund a lot of space uh, programs, uh, but now we're seeing a trend towards commercial space activity, and this will allow it to become more sustainable. This will increase the, the momentum and, uh, and really allow it to take off. And AI needs to be the same way, in my mind. It has to have potential for cost savings or product improvement. And so one of the most exciting things that happened to us was last year, Procter & Gamble came to us so since Ultralytics is so small, we have no sales team. Um, we, don't, we don't call any people. We don't try and sell them on YOLO or anything like that. But we get a lot of emails coming in, a lot of calls. And one of them was from the chief scientist at Procter & Gamble, Steve Varga, uh, from their office in Cincinnati. And Steve had a problem. He said that the vision systems that they use for flaw detection on their assembly lines, uh, they're supposed to detect default or flawed products and throw them away. And he said sometimes they make a mistake and they throw away a good product. He said this is costing the company a lot of money every year, and he, he wanted to experiment with YOLO V5. And so he had a few questions. We worked with him. And at the end of this POC, uh, Procter & Gamble, they were so impressed with the result on this one assembly line that they experimented with that they, they, did, a few, they did a bit of number crunching back of the envelope calculation. They said if they extrapolated this to the entire uh, organization, all of their factories, they could save up to $500 million a year. Uh, so this is this is incredible real world savings uh, for blue chip companies. So this is this is having like a, an amazing impact. Um, we got this really cool use case. So Kevin De Bruyne at Manchester City. I don't know if any of you guys are soccer fans, but Man I think City. Manchester City. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think they, they were playing Real. Wait, was that Real Madrid this year? I forget if it was, it was this Champions League, but. I'm not a big fan of Kevin myself, but he's a big fan of YOLO. And so Kevin. <laughs> All right, Kevin, time out. What's your, what's your squad, Glenn? <laughs> oh, I'm in Madrid here. I got I to gotta be a Real Madrid fan. You know? <laughs> no, I got you. I got you. <laughs> um, but I'm kind of sad that Ronaldo left. It hasn't been the same since. But they've been doing pretty good since he left. I don't know, I don't know if it's coincidence or not. But So, anyway, so De Bruyne uh, sunk uh, some you investments into this option, company though. called Ball AI. <laughs> you don't have an option, so, but... Real Madrid. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, actually, I could probably use that myself because I like watching soccer, but I'm not very good at playing it. And so, the idea is Kevin wanted to make an app for like kids to learn how to play soccer better. And we have Yolo V5 at the core of this app and it tracks the players and the balls and it gets analytics uh, and it gives you pointers on improving your shots and techniques to make you better. And this is, uh, this is out there on the app store right now. It's called Ball In Without the Eye. And uh, last time I checked, it had four and a half stars, so people seem to like it. So it looks like YOLO is working in the real world for, uh, for real apps that are funded by superstars. Okay, and this is a really good use case too. Uh, so there's a French company called Sowit, uh, which is helping farmers in Africa with something called crop yield estimation. And so what they do is they've created an app for Android devices, low power Android devices. The farmer goes around and he scans uh, the trees that he has and it tells him, uh, how much fruit there is and whether it's ripe and like how many days until until harvest. And this allows them to get better intelligence and to negotiate better with these sort of harvesting conglomerates that seem to hold a lot of power there. And so it is targeting uh, an amazing 35,000 farmers with this app by the end of 2022. And this is using YOLO V5, obviously, like right there uh, to do all this. And so so this is really incredible. This is, this is helping underprivileged communities uh, with the latest technology. So we're putting like, yeah, some of the amazing. most advanced AI mm -hmm. 
into some of the lo lowest power mobile devices and, and putting those into the hands of like some of the, the poorest people in the world. So this is really like uh, something that I feel really good about. And of course there's other fun use cases. We have this little kid, I don't know how old he is. It says 10 years old, but I looks even younger. So he made an app with, wow. with YOLO and uh, it detects, this is supposed to be a video, but since it's a PDF, we can't see it. It detects okay. different types of toy cars. So it just makes you feel like really happy that like even little kids are using YOLO uh, for projects. And, and one day, like I, my main mission actually is to, is to make it so simple that my mom could use it one day. She's, yeah. We're not there yet, but we're, we're heading in that direction. Yeah, I think once uh, you've got the 10 year olds building cool stuff, you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, yeah. I'm not sure if there's any 10 year olds raising GitHub issues, but, uh, but I'm on there like every day. <laughs> At least I hope them. not. If there <laughs> are, then I'm, I'm talking to them. <laughs> so, uh, so we've got a few numbers here. This is actually out of date by like a few months, um, but we picked up a lot of stars. We got a lot of users and, and the repo is just like super popular. If we compare it to like some of the other players out there. So I like, I like big player comparisons because I see this as a bit of a David and Goliath contest because we've done so much with so little. Uh, like when I, when I showed up on the scene, like Facebook to Tektron was kind of like the elephant in the room and we passed mm -hmm. them last year. Uh, and I think it's just because we've been trying to make it just really simple and really easy. And I've got a few slides here about our upcoming product. So we have something called Ultralytics Hub. And this is what most of the team is working on. And Hub is sort of the next natural evolution for YOLO v5. So as a code base, YOLO v5 can only be so simple. And I want to make it even simpler. Uh, I want people that just don't know Python to still be able to de deploy YOLO v5 models to train them. And uh, until this thing launches, I don't think my mom is going to be able to do that. And so the idea here is pretty simple. Uh, we, we have a data set. Uh, with some labels, you can do this yourself, or you can import this from tools like RoboFlow. Number two is you select one of our models to train. So Yolo's got a whole family of models. And the reason there's a family is because uh, they target different use cases. So the very small and light ones are good for mobile apps, um, but they're not as accurate as the bigger ones, which are slower. So uh, so you click which model you want. And number three is, is once it's done training, which might take a few hours or a few days, depending on the size of the data set, then you deploy it anywhere that you want. And this could be something like an app, uh, you could deploy it with say Core ML, TF Lite. You deploy this to like low power, like Raspberry Pi devices with say OpenVINO or Onyx, or you could deploy it to a cloud solution, maybe with a GPU backend like TensorRT. There's so many different options these days. And we've sunk a lot of effort into making uh, each of those like really easy, uh, which is something uh, that I believe in because I think we need to help people like at all sides of, of this loop. Uh, I think we have it, yeah, next slide, perfect. So AI should, should really, be uh, a continuous experience like this. So we should train models, deploy them, and then figure out where they're not performing well, collecting edge cases, and then uploading this to our data set. So we can improve our data set and then redeploy after training and then just keep doing this. And the, the best example that I can think of today is Tesla. So Tesla has their deployed fleet. Uh, they update the cars with new, uh, with new versions of autopilot. Uh, but it also comes with new versions of, of other AIs, which are looking for edge cases, uh, which are failure points in the main AI. And it's collecting things like say stop signs at weird angles or potholes that are hard to see. And then they have a team that's labeling those, they're retraining and redeploying. And, uh, and so this is happening on a continuous basis. And I think, I think for having real world products that perform the best, this is, uh, this is vital. And so this is something I always try and uh, impart on people. And yeah, the, the that's real it. world is always yeah. changing too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And this will this will address things like domain drift. So, if you train your model in the spring and then suddenly it starts snowing in the winter, it might just stop working. And so, this is you need to keep all this in mind. So, we have domain drift in time for seasons, but also geographic. So, you could train it on clothing, uh, say in Europe, and then you go to the Middle East, and it'll stop detecting clothing. And so, so this is really important. So, as as different things drift, like styles. Uh, weather, things like that. It's important to keep updating the data set, keep it current, and uh, and in that way, redeploy the model. So maybe one day AI models are going to be like us, and they'll just learn on the fly. But until that day, like we need to keep this cycle going uh, to deliver the best product. And again, the main motivation here is to put these powerful tools in the hands of everybody uh, to make the capability uh, simple to use and to make sure that everybody has access to it. We've got a bit of a roadmap here. Quick uh, uh, question. Yeah. Uh, is the hub only for uh, detection models or you will also have something for uh, segmentation, classification, et cetera? Yeah, that's the exciting thing. So uh, it's gonna be for all three tasks. It's gonna be for classification, 
segmentation and detection, um, which is it's going to be exciting, but it's introducing a lot of homework for us. So we want to use a common backbone and as much commonality as possible between the different families. And so we are we're working on these efforts right now. We're training on ImageNet to uh, to develop the hyperparameters that we want for classification. And hopefully this will launch in the next few months here. So um, we've really only got two products here. We've got YOLO, and we've got Hub down here. And so this slide is a few months old. Uh, so we have uh, essentially YOLO is just uh, continuous AI R&D forever. So we never want to stop this. We always want to keep putting the best tools out there. We want to learn from other competitors out in the field, uh, from the big companies, the small companies, and just individual contributors. And we sort of want to cherry pick the best elements from everybody and fold them back into future versions of YOLO. And for Hub, we have a free version, which is uh, it's in beta right now, and it's going to launch, I think, in September. And then we have a pro version with some extra goodies uh, at a small price point and a small monthly point. And then for big companies like Procter & Gamble, we want an enterprise solution. And we're supposed to launch that at the end of this year. And hopefully this will allow us to, uh, to get more revenue and just keep feeding back into this virtual cycle. So that's it. I'd like to leave you with uh, just this idea. You know, I think uh, everyone here, I think should try and uh, also think about what potential they have to improve the lives of the people around them. I think if we all think like this and we put our minds together, I think we can accomplish a lot. So, so thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I guess, let me know. Wow, great, uh, great presentation here. I, I love your, your ending there. I would like to make sure that everybody knows we mean change the world for the better. <laughs> change the world for the better. Uh, it's been a rough couple of years. And so I just want to make sure that everybody knows that that's the case. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Glenn. Uh, I guess it's, let's do our let's do our trivia giveaway here. Um, it's case this is your first time joining us, or if you just need a reminder, one of the things we do every single week here on OpenCV Weekly Webinar is a giveaway to you in the audience. One lucky winner in the Zoom chat will win the OpenCV course of their choosing. In order to win, you'll have to answer a question, which I'm about to ask you in the Zoom chat. If you're not in Zoom, there's still time to get in there. Go to opencv.live and hop in the Zoom chat. You've got about five seconds. Um, so and just so, I mean, I don't know how many people know about uh, OpenCV courses. OpenCV has a series of five courses, OpenCV for beginners, OpenCV um, uh, Computer Vision 1, which is the introductory course in Computer Vision, Computer version two, which is all about applications. And we also have deep learning with PyTorch and deep learning with TensorFlow. So as you know, that YOLO V5 is based off of uh, PyTorch. So, you know, people who may be interested in both may want the deep learning with PyTorch course. Yeah, um, and you'll be able to choose. I'll, I'll ask you, you know, once you win, of course. So get ready to answer here, folks. Um, during the presentation, Glenn mentioned his previous gig and talked about trying to detect certain particles. Name one of those particles. <laughs> oh, damn, Richard, you got me. You got me, Rich. There's, a, there's uh, any physicists so, out there, do you? <laughs> Richard, <laughs> Richard Chung, uh, please send one email to phil at opencv.org and you will uh, be able to choose whichever of the courses we currently offer. If you know which one you want, go ahead and tell me in the email and we'll uh, make sure you get that course. Um, we've got a, got a bunch of questions here. I'm gonna switch our camera view here so we can see our, see our illustrious guest. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us on this first episode with our new virtual set. I mean, we had uh, uh, folks who joined us live here. We we'll, we'll, got to see a peek behind the curtain with the crazy looping audio we had earlier, which I will chop out of the released episode on YouTube because I'm a professional, damn it. Um, <laughs> but I'm kidding, I'm not. Uh, the, uh, let's, let's, let's move on to some questions here. Um, Cecil would like to know, can you load your own models into the Ultralytics app or does it just have the preset uh, you know, sort of use cases, uh, Glenn? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So the app I made was simply the official models, but the the main benefit of, of Hub is it's got two components. It's got a web and an app component. The idea is you train your models and then they're instantly available to preview on the app. Um, so let's see, so the way it works is, is we'll look at your device and if it's, a, if it's an Apple device, we'll export it to CoreML and then download it straight to the app and you can start using it. And if it's an Android device, we'll export it to TF Lite. So 
this is uh this is this is kind of like what I really wanted. I want people to train a model and then just put it in their hands like right away as fast as possible to to get that feedback. Yeah, uh, that's that's awesome. Um, um we we also uh, another question from the audience. Beth on LinkedIn would like to know: Does the cat have a name? Um, you've noticed our our little buddy under the desk here. Um, the cat does not <laughs> currently have a name. If you uh, have suggestions for what to name the cat, please send those to newsletter at opencv.org, and uh, maybe we'll pick one of your names or just come up with a totally different one. No promises. Um, <laughs> Let's see, uh, Richard would like to know is, uh, our, our trivia winner, Richard would like to know, is the latest YOLO V5 supported and optimized for OpenCV AI kits such as OKD? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, we have export to Onyx and OpenVINO, and I know for Onyx exports, these are compatible with like CV2 DNN inference. Uh, so they should be directly loadable. Uh, OpenVINO is uh, what you're looking for. Uh... So, Glenn, mm -hmm. if, it, if it works on OpenVINO, the size, you can easily use one of the... So, there are five different sizes for Euro V5. And mm -hmm. uh, if you use the right size model, uh, the OpenVINO version of it, then uh, it will work on OpenCV AI kit. Okay, awesome. Excellent. Um, yeah, big shout out to our, our friends and uh, occasional co-conspirators and collaborators at OpenVINO. Um, Hopefully, we'll be doing something with them uh, soon uh, again. Mm. Um, in addition to, they were one of our, they were the main sponsor behind uh, OpenCV AI Game Show, which we are still planning to do more of. Uh, hint, hint. Um, oh wow! Okay. So uh, uh, Andre would like to know, uh, Yolo V7 was just released. Um, how have you gotten a chance to try it out? And does it, how does it compare with uh, your current uh, version six of Yolo V5, Len? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I, I saw the V7 had been released by Alexi and company, uh, Yang King Yu, and mm -hmm. I haven't had a chance to thoroughly review it, but initially it looks like an interesting contribution. And I, you know, I'm excited anytime that uh, someone else comes out with advances in the field. I think um, to really get to the next step, to really make these models perform well, we don't just want to put it in everybody's hands, but they also need to be performant in real world situations. And everybody that's doing research in the field is contributing greatly to this, especially in the, in the open source space. I think those are the two most important things. And so I think Alexi is making uh, significant contributions and uh, I appreciate what he's doing. That's cool. It's, it's great that there's no, you know, a lot of times you get these weird tech feuds with people and it doesn't seem like that's mm. the case here. And so that's, you know, that's, that's great. Um, well, well, one, one bit, suggestion yeah, I have, so, uh, two suggestions yeah. actually. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, you should get uh, the next version you come up with, it probably just name it not a version, but something else. That way you will have your mm -hmm. own YOLO that people and people don't get this, uh, you know, it's a, it's an uh, yeah. rubric race right now. <laughs> I have the biggest <laughs> yeah. number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, why I mean, not just yeah. call it YOLO a billion, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think. Well, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can call it YOLO Infinity, which will also look like YOLO 8 if you turn it around. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Hey, nobody, YOLO, nobody's going to release infinity. any version higher than Infinity. That's yeah. right. Well, yeah. no, there'll just be Infinity plus one, obviously. You guys were kids once. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see what else we got here. Um, so how uh, we, we uh, one of our one of our frequent uh, another frequent collaborator and an OpenCV member um, is RoboFlow, and a couple mm -hmm. folks in the audience would like to know, Glenn, how do you compare how would you you would compare the services RoboFlow and Ultralytics? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so I'm I'm really good friends with RoboFlow too. I talked to Joseph Nelson there a it's lot. It's hard not to be. And, damn that guy for being yeah, so personable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so when I started, uh, actually when they started also like two years ago, RoboFlow was uh, more of like a wrapper to train models. And so they did a good job of like helping you train different types of models. And I think more recently they've seen value on the data set side and they put a lot more emphasis there. And so I think we, we partner perfectly. Uh, we want people to be able to select a RoboFlow data set directly and just train on it at Ultralytics Hub. And I think uh, the synergy there will be really powerful. Um, I think also even for the open source YOLO v5, I think RoboFlow is a tremendous asset. It helps you label your data. 
uh, and they can export directly to Yolo V5 from there and also directly to uh, Ultralytics Hub in the future. So I think it's, uh, it's good to, like my main goal is to just make this whole easier. And so I want to partner with companies that provide uh, things that we don't at the moment. So for example, Ultralytics doesn't do data sets. And so, um, but we do want to help people find data and annotate it. And so for that reason, you know, we typically point them to partners that uh, work well, like RoboFlow. Cool. Yeah. Again, in all of this, know, it's, it's actually, nice. go ahead, Stia. So, in all of this, you know, we, we uh, often think about these uh, different services are as competitors, but I like to think of them as options, right? People have different options. People like different flavors. You know, somebody somebody may like one flavor more than the other, and having these options is a great thing, first of all. And second thing is that this AI pie is going growing so big, you know that you just need a small slice of the pie to have a very profitable operation. And mm -hmm. you should not worry about, oh, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, this is a fixed pie, right? And mm -hmm. I need to have a bigger slice of the pie. I need to have a bigger market share and things like that. And I personally feel that, that those um, that's not the right way to think about it. We should be focusing on making the pie bigger. And once you make the pie bigger, even if you have a reasonable slice, you're satisfied and you have a profitable business. You don't need to you know, uh, take the market over, right? There is space for everybody and uh, there are uh, various options available, right? Uh, so for people to try out. We don't want a monopoly of anything. We want different options for people. That's yeah, right, Sadia. I think a, a rising pie would end. solve those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a good good way to put it, Glenn. I, and and yeah, the the, I mean, it, even if you love pie, you can only eat so much pie. <laughs> There's only so much pie, um, and I you know that that metaphor is a good one. That you know not not every flavor is for everybody. We talk about this in one of my favorite um, entertainment mediums of pro professional wrestling. Uh, there's a lot of flavors of ice cream out there, not because all the flavors that existed were bad but because people like different flavors of stuff. Um, not every flavor has to be for everybody. And the fact that there is variety in it means like it's a show, it's a sign of uh, the strength of the medium. It's the strength of the industry that there's so many flavors. If it was mm -hmm. not popular or nobody cared, there'd be two flavors. Um, and so I think, you know, that that's a really important perspective to keep uh, during, during this sort of stuff. Um, right. That's, that's where that's true. Also, yeah. too far. I think strawberry yeah. is the best flavor, and that's all one needs. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to argue. I'm a straw I'm a strawberry homer here. Uh, big fan, big fan of strawberry ice cream for sure. Now, do you like the stuff that has little chunks of strawberry in it? Because that's a no go for me. <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's let's let the audience ask more questions. <laughs> uh, sure, sure, fine. Um, uh, Andre uh, has another question here. Do you think YOLO, the YOLO family became more mainstream? Uh, why do you think YOLO became more mainstream in practical object detection than some of the other frameworks out there? Mm. Oh, oh, I think it's because, um, well, I can, okay, so from, from my side, uh, I think the reason is because um, like when I came on, I wanted to make this just much simpler. I, I sort of have this aversion to to complications. And I wanted to make it simpler for myself because it, it was like a personal, painful process. And coming in, in as an outsider, I think is what, I think that was the main difference. So I think a lot of the research, a lot of the R&D is coming from people that are doing master's degrees and PhDs in the field. And I think when you're uh, at a low level focused on the details, sometimes you lose sight of the bigger picture. And so, so those kinds of contributions are important incredibly important um but my set of priorities was different it was really translating that into something that could be used outside of the lab in the real world and making that easy and i think that really resonated and maybe also uh like when joseph started i think maybe just the personal touch so for example google came out with a competing architecture called efficient debt um but we don't exactly know like who the researchers were working on it uh and in the publication you know they talk about the resources that were used to train the models, which is very impressive, but very off-putting for people that don't have access to this. Uh, so I think at, at the low level, I think the YOLO models were, uh, they were produced by the little guy, you know, like it just Joseph, a student at university got started with them. And then myself with, with no clients and no revenue, just working on it uh, uh, as a hobby. 
And, uh, and, and since I was working on it as a hobby, I didn't have access to a lot of resources. And so I needed to, I needed to work on something that was easy to train with the, without a huge budget. And that's really important for a lot of people. So I think it's a combination of things, but, but keeping it simple, um, keeping it easy to train without access to significant resources, and also simply being uh, just like a single contributor, I think inspires other people. It, it kind of tells them that they can have a similar impact, which is really important because uh, if you're a student at university and uh, you see that Google releases a model that's great, but, but it doesn't connect to you, like you don't feel that you can have an impact on the field. Whereas if it's just one guy making something, then, then suddenly you do think that. You think, oh, well, if he did it, maybe I can do it. And I think that's really important for people to believe in. One other thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, when OpenCV was released, uh, it was a C library, then we made it a C++ library. And now it, had, it has bindings in several languages, including Python. And by just Especially making Python. It, the Python binding is responsible for like half of OpenCV's uh, usage, if not more. Uh, the data is very difficult to uh, extract there, but there is a huge number of Python users. And even though I started as uh, C++, I ended up uh, you know, using Python more and more. Now, the same thing happened with uh, YOLO also, right? The reason YOLO v5 is very popular is also because it adopted PyTorch. Was what, it was mm -hmm. you basically uh, you know, uh, grabbed onto the tails of two uh, interesting uh, things that were taking mm -hmm. off. One was YOLO and the other was PyTorch. And mm -hmm. it is almost inevitable if you do a good job. It has to be easy to use. It has to be uh, really good. But uh, this, these two things taking off, uh, I think it contributed a lot to the success of YOLO v5. Uh, in addition to the fact that you made it really good uh, and simple to use. Yeah, absolutely. I owe a lot to the PyTorch team. Uh, when I first started in AI, I had a big choice to make. I, and the choice was whether I go with TensorFlow or whether I experiment with PyTorch. And it looks like I've chosen the right path. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly hope so. It seems that way. I love, uh, you've got a nice story here in you uh, you talked a little bit about this when you were first starting out, but basically you solved your own problems and now you're using the result of that to help other people solve their own problems, which I think is a really cool way to kind of wrap it up and put a bow on the episode here. Um, we're, we're getting very nearly, we're getting very near the end. Um, Satya, would you like to uh, take us home before I uh, hit the credits music? Well, I, uh, before we end this, I want to thank Vikas Reddy from mm -hmm. Lightfrist, uh, which this com the company has made uh, this studio possible. And we have closely worked with them. Uh, they did, the, the whole team uh, did a great job. I don't know whether we can stream Vikas's uh, audio, <laughs> uh, but if we can. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Hi. Hi, hi, Vikas. Vikas. Hey, yeah, I'll stop my video. <laughs> or yeah, I can, I can do both. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I appreciate that, guys. Um, yeah, it's been, uh, yeah, and sorry for the audio issues earlier. I was just going to be the uh, silent uh, uh, audio tech support here. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been awesome working with you guys. I really appreciate, uh, Glenn, you being the, the first guinea pig here to, uh, to try this out. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for iterating closely with us. We're excited to come back uh, even better uh, next week. Yeah, for sure. And uh, before, so one, uh, another quick thing before we uh, switch out here, I'm going to go ahead and hit uh, this button, which should uh, give everybody a nice look at our as of yet <laughs> unnamed cat friend. Um, please feel free to uh, suggest That's the, cat cam. the cat. Yeah, cat cam is up. Um, yeah. Newsletter at opencv.org. Please uh, send in your suggestions. Um, yeah, Satya, you want to you want to take us home? All right. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Vikas. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, it was a great presentation and I'm so happy that you put together, you know, not just the technical part, but also how uh, we have to create responsible AI and, uh, you know, the various examples you gave. It is very inspirational for all our uh, audience. And Phil, thank you for putting the show together. Uh, I know you worked with Vikas uh, on putting this uh, whole studio yeah. together. Thank you so yeah. much. And last but not the least, our audience, thank you guys. It makes our day whenever uh, we see a lot of people joining in and getting value from, uh, from the show. And it keeps us uh, motivated. So that's Absolutely. it. Uh, see you next week. Thank you, Satya. Bye, that's guys. Right.
We would not do this show if you didn't watch. Take care of yourselves out there. Take care of somebody else. Please enjoy this outro uh, and music by the Monster Association. Um, yeah, so they should. People should can still hear us talk over the credits. So uh, we can, you know. Uh, so yeah, seriously, thanks everybody. This was uh, this was really it's fun. pretty fun. Yeah, but great, yeah, like good, good early viewership numbers here. This is one of our most popular episodes this year. Oh, awesome! Glad to hear it. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll we'll uh, see you next time. Um, same bat time, same bat channel, 9 a.m. Pacific every Thursday. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by OpenCV Courses. Learn computer vision and AI from the best at opencv.org slash courses. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter. Um, Where did you put us, Phil? And because, I mean, because uh, you may not be I'm able not, to... I'm not actually sure what happened. When I woke up, we were here. <laughs>